Thank you for auditing the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who was ridiculously excited to once again be talking about everything, everything in the new album, Mountainhead. Now, if you haven't been paying attention to this channel, uh, their last album, Raw Data Feel, which you can see behind me, that's the gatefold, uh, I loved it. I was absolutely shocked by it. I had never heard their music before. That was my introduction. So this is my second Everything Everything album, even though it's their sixth album, and I'm going to do the polemic thing where I'm going to say something really broad and see if it sticks, okay? When I say really big, hyperbolic things, uh, it's mainly to get people thinking. It's to get discourse going. I wish there was a, a, a less silly cheat code than using hyperbolic statements like the most, but it does get people thinking. So I'm not going to say that Everything Everything is the best rock band in the world, nor am I going to say that they are the best pop act in the world, but is it not possible that they are the best pop band in the world? Like, 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 doesn't really exist anymore. And the problem is, they're probably not really a pop band. I, I don't know. I don't think they have the level of popularity of, like, the 1975. But listening to this album, despite the fact that it is so sincere and so well thought out and so well produced and so well made, it is hook after hook after hook with a ridiculously engaging lead singer who draws you in. What are they if not a great pop rock band? In a lot of ways, I sort of I hear this album and when I don't like it, it reminds me of Maroon 5, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, sometimes I hear a little Peter Gabriel in there. They themselves compare themselves to the Chili Peppers at some point. But really, the, the comparison that I want to make is, is right behind me there, over there. It's you too. You might not understand this if you're a young person. And I didn't really appreciate it at the time, so bad on me, okay? There was a time in the 1990s and late 1980s where, like, you too was as big as whatever you think of, as Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, that there was a band of people who made music together, and despite the fact they were making rock and roll and they played all their own instruments, and they had a producer, but the producer wasn't some super producer from Sweden who came down and turned everything into the same formula, they managed to be selling out football stadiums and selling out all over the world. Now, obviously, U2 is still a pop band. Obviously, they're still popular. They sold out the Sphere. I'm sorry. They sold out, period. They sold out the Sphere. <laughs> Those two things go together. And, and I'm not trying to say that they're not it, but they're not it, right? It's not like U2 comes out with a new album and everyone's excited to go see the new album being played. They're excited to go here. I still haven't came... I still haven't heard what I'm looking for, and uh, I want to go where the streets aren't named. You know, all their famous songs you know, off the album The Josh Tree. But the reason that I want to compare Everything Everything to U2 is not so much that they sound alike. It's just like, it made me realize that I took U2 for granted. Now, to be fair to myself, I, I did consider Zeropa one of the best albums of the 90s. I still do. I love that album. But what U2 did was they managed to stay a band. They managed to stay thematically interesting. They managed to stay experimental. They were, they were ubiquitous and they were powerful and they used that power for good. And I don't mean Bono running around talking about Africa, although that is using his power for good. I mean artistically they used their power for good for expanding. I'm not saying that Radiohead never would have made Kid A if it weren't for Octung Baby and Europa and Zuropa, but it's possible that they wouldn't, okay? So that's the sort of comparison. I've also been thinking a lot about YouTube because, listen, my phone has that album again. My iPhone, the, I erased the U2 album, The Songs of Innocence, like 10 years ago, and now it popped back up again. How do you make yourself so unlikable? So to sort of further this continuation, and again, it's not that they're similar sounding. I don't think if you put them next to each other, you'd say they're the same. But I just long to live in a world where everything, everything is ubiquitous, where they are selling out football stadiums, where everybody, everybody talks about every single, every single song on the album and studies it and they have big music hits. That's fine. That's not the world we live in. Only Beyonce and Taylor Swift can sell out stadiums with new music. That's fine. But what I really like about this, and I like this about the raw data feel as well, is they really know how to be right in that zone of intellectual 
pondering and messaging without going too far. Much like, I guess Europa for that matter, they have a consistent, clear message to this album, a clear theme. They exercise that theme in many different voices, but it all comes back to the central fugue, the central concept that they have, the album of the Mountainhead, which I'll describe. And it's never too much. It's never too far out, but it's also never quite just beat you over the head with how simple it is. It really is a feat. Uh, I, I, I did uh, consult a fair amount with, uh, with Lyric Genius, which is very good for certain rock groups. Like, I don't think it's great all the time for rap music, but for certain rock groups, they sort of do a good job of, of including quotes from the artists that apply to each song. So it's like a, a very efficient way to do research. So according to the, the lead singer, is it Higgs? Is that the name? I think that sounds right. It's either Higgs or Higgins, but I probably think Higgins because I used to watch a lot of Magnum P.I. growing up. So this is what Higgs says, or Higgins, we'll, we'll just go with Higgs, uh, says about this. This is a, an album about a, quote, alternate society in which those at the bottom of society's ladder are forced to work relentlessly to keep its elite, those at the mountain's peak, elevated. What's that, that meme that's not Eddie Murphy, where he's like, I see what you did there. You know that meme of not Eddie Murphy, but it looks like Eddie Murphy? Well, maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'm just being racist or just doing autofill with a dude who looks like he's a funny guy in the 80s. Point is, that whole thing, that, it's very funny because he's talking about an alternate society that is a pyramid in which the people at the bottom have to work to keep the people at the top uh, at their position. And that is the reality of the world that we live in. It's an alternate society that is, in fact, our society. Now, to be fair, this is also the same kind of, good lord, that's loud. I put you on Do Not Disturb. What part of Do Not Disturb? Oh, I know why. It's because that was my wife. And she overrides everything. Everything, everything. Anyways, I just muted my computer. I am going to be playing some TV later, so we're going to have to see that. We do live in a society where the people at the bottom have to work so hard, so hard, to keep the people at the top ridiculously rich. This is the same way that the, that the Ancien Régime worked in France, where you had all of the peasants at the bottom working super hard to make sure the nobility at the top were comfortable and well-fed and didn't have to work. We live in a time of increasing wealth disparity. The wealth gap is growing and ever-growing, and that's the way we seem to have it. I have a socialist friend of mine, British, uh, uh, who's also a physicist, very funny guy. We disagree on a lot of things, but he, he posts this meme once <laughs> that, that talks about a boss coming into work in a Ferrari. And, uh, you know, it's a beautiful new Enzo Ferrari, you know, $200,000 car. And one of his workers comes up to him and says, wow, boss, that's a great car. He says, <laughs> thanks, Charles. And you know what? It's Bill. <laughs> thanks, Bill. Uh, you know what? If you work really hard every single day, sometime in the future, I'll be able to buy a second one. That's the world that we live in, and that's the world that's described. But it's using the term mountainhead. Before I talk about mountainhead and what it means, let me tell you a funny, unrelated, related story. When I was in college, there was this girl that like, everyone thought was just super awesome. I never quite got it. I don't remember if her name was Chelsea or Hannah. <sighs> I think it might have been Hannah or Chelsea. Anyways, everyone was just fascinated by this girl. I, I didn't quite get what it was, but they just thought she was amazing. And I, I was cool enough with her, you know? And so one day she's walking, she walks into, into a dorm room where I'm sitting there, maybe some kind of party, people hanging out. And she has a copy of Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard, <laughs> which if you don't know, it's the foundational text of Christian, uh, not Christian scientist, that's it, uh, uh, Mary, Bader, Mary Baker Eddy, um, Scientology, okay? And so she's, she has a copy of Dianetics in her hand. And I know that she's a very powerfully influential woman. I don't, I don't know why. I shouldn't have called her a girl. I don't know. I was a boy at the time, but still she's a woman, okay? Um, I was 20, but still a boy. It doesn't matter. Point is, she's a woman, and there she was, and she was very influential, and she was reading Dianetics, and then, you know, alarms go off. I'm like, oh, jeez, are you a Scientologist? I say, oh, are, are you a Scientologist? She's like, what's that? Like, well, you're reading Dianetics. Yeah, I don't know. I just someone gave me this book. Are, are you aware there's like a whole framework and religion that's based off of this book? No. 
So, so that was that. As far as I know, she never became, she never became a member of that religion, which some people call a cult. But really, people are just displacing their anger at all religions on one specific religion. It's not that far off from any other religions. But let's not get into that, okay? I don't want to make my friend Lee too happy. <laughs> He's a super atheist, dude. In addition to telling me that Ferrari joke. The reason I tell that joke is that I once read The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand? How do you pronounce her name? Ayn Rand. A very influential writer, author. Uh, why am I talking like Fantano? Writer, author, <laughs> teeth. Um, like, a very important author. A future wife of, of the uh, of Alan Greenspan. Weird story there. And a real proponent of objectivism and libertarianism, to the point where there's a libertarian senator whose name is Rand after Ayn Rand. And her whole belief is in the power of the individual and the disgusting filth of the collective, that all of us together are weak and only one single person with their strength and brilliance and vitality and individuality can crush the system and become the top of the top, the head of the fountain from which all brilliance will flow. Only with absolute freedom and power given to the individual can we have any hope of any real freedom as a society. We must destroy the collective that is bringing us down and exalt the individual. Oh. Oh. Okay. I didn't know that's what it was. I had a book on tape of the Fountainhead. And I just listened to this story and I thought... This Howard Rourke fellow is a little bitch, <laughs> okay? That was before I stopped using that word. I don't like, like using gendered insults. But I remember thinking, who is this privileged little baby man? Okay, if you've read The Fountainhead, it's about an architect who is the example of the strong individual who has so much power and brilliance in his head and the whole world is against him because they just want him to participate in society and he is so much better than society, okay? But he's a, a privileged little baby man. Do you know how much privilege you have to have in your life to be able to have that kind of individual power? Do you understand how much collective suffering must under must be suffered by other people in order for you to have that moment of individual brilliance? It's a bunk system. Like Scientology. Hey, I'll say it. Fountainhead's done a lot more damage than Dianetics. Okay? So I am all with you, everything, everything, with your entire book poking fun at the fountainhead with the mountainhead where instead of a fountain it's talking about this unequal society that we live in now it's interesting it's important and it rules that they took their name i just did some research on the band before i started the video from the opening of the album kid a right behind me everything in its right place where tom york says everything everything that's where they took their name from and that's where it all comes together because I'm gonna tell you a dirty little secret Radiohead loves you too Tom York bites Bono all the time have you ever heard a Radiohead song where at the end he's all like who, who, who gave him the who who gave him the who who gave him who gave him the who i'm on fire today did you see my little my little libertarian rant jesus i could be a cult leader anyways who gave tom york the who bono gave him the who so i really enjoy that because that's how i feel this band is i feel like they learned from that moment where radiohead said we're not just going to be a rock band we're also going to be an experimental band that was echoing you two saying we're not just going to be a pop band we're also going to be an experimental band and everything everything just sort of came at that but <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry blokes that train left you don't get to be you don't get to fill soccer stadiums or football stadiums. Uh, you're just too late. I'm sorry. So you're just going to have to make a wonderful living off your off of your art and have people love you. But you're not going to be super duper 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 stars. Anyways, uh, I try to do research on England whenever I study a British band. That's my new thing because like uh, I just don't know enough about the European Anglosphere. But they're from Manchester. I, I've been to Manchester. Uh, I did a video, uh, the, the a tour of Manchester. I went to all the spots in Morrissey's life that were uh, immortalized in his music. 
it's a fun video. It's on my old personal channel. I don't think you can be able to find it. <laughs> Feel free to look for it if you want. Um, so, you know, I already know. I know a lot. You know, I often try to... I remember, I remember I was around a fountain. They had like this fancy fountain. I pretended that was the fountain from we around the fountain. And I was talking to somebody about about the, the, the soccer situation because I, I, I've my whole life I've been looking for a team in the Premier League to support. And I knew that like Manchester United was like for busters, you know, because like they were the most popular and the biggest team. But I found out that they there was another team in in Manchester and so I'm like well that's cool I'll support that team but they're not even in the pre in like the Premier League right now I'm not going to be a loser who only supports the front runners I'm going to support Manchester City <laughs> so anyways I stopped paying attention I come back to soccer like 20 years later and now the situation's reversed but it doesn't matter I also used to live next door to the Glazers um, or some glazers very nice people so i'm sorry they're nice people every glazer i've met nice people all right so anyways uh, that's my little manchester story for you i also got lost trying to find the salford lads club it's very hard to find if you like this video so far pl could you please at least just give me a heart for my little libertarian rant i i think i was inspired sorry toby's just stretching right here that's my dog and bo's over there too i was inspired so just give me a give me a smash like bucket for that. If you want to say A V A A, that stands for awesome video as always. I always heart a comment that has those letters in it. Just a fun little way for us to communicate. I used to say don't hit the 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 that little bell, but I do like live premieres for almost every one of my videos where I'm in the chat and I'm talking with you. I had one today. It was very 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 active with someone who clearly had never watched my channel before getting mad at me it was very funny so uh you can do that as well all right my example song from the album is the second track off the album the end of the contender click above everything everything above no way out for the end of the contender sometimes i like to play with the camera right i don't do editing right so i can't like do fun cool stuff so all i can really do is play with the space that the camera's in so let me show you what the vocals are like in the song <laughs> hi i'm the singer i'm higgs and or higgins la 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 okay it is really in your face but there's this awesome like is it like vocoder like cool radiohead weird stuff is it auto-tune is it AI supplemented? There is some kind of robotic weirdness over his voice on the whole album, which there's one thing you can learn from Thomas York is you can always be more human when you are more robotic. Maybe you learn that from Daft Punk. I don't know what it is, but there's a slight something. And maybe it's how he sings, but just starts off with his lyrics. Call the cops and tell them what I want. My battery's 100%. It all makes sense. I am on fire today. The, this opening line is just, whew, call the cops and tell them what I want. So immediately I'm thinking, is this Karen Pop? You know, like the, like the, the meme of the women who call the police on uh, random people of color because they're just mad and like you can treat the police like your service. And then just the line, my battery's 100%. Whew, I just, I just got a, a plug-in Prius. I bought a used car last week. I'm very excited. And when my battery is at 100%, it's a great feeling. 25 miles of, of no gas. 25. My battery is My battery. How much time do you spend thinking about our batteries? How much time do you spend thinking about your battery? I think about my battery all the time. And there's this beautiful line. And then it like breaks into this. It's like a total pop song. Tell me how this is less of a pop song than anything off the new Ariana Grande album, which I think I'm going to have to review. How? How? This is catchy as hell. And then the synths come on, and it's basically that Rihanna song. We found love in a dangerous place. But then there's some real drums. The drummer is great in this band. It's slightly behind the beat. The way it breaks into this pre-chorus with like a pixie-style guitar line. And these lyrics, it's all about don't, you know, don't blame it on the empire. What is he talking about? What is this song about? I sort of get it. I will tell you in a second when I do get it. And then he makes references to it's all about the Benjamins. That's why you see back here, Puff Daddy, No Way Out. That album is terrible. It's terrible. It's te Puff Daddy makes bad music. But the songs that are good on that album are so good that I bought that CD. And if I lost that CD, I'd buy that CD again. 
All About the Benjamins is on that song, is on that album, and it's worth owning that entire thing, which also includes I'll Be Missing You, which is inarguably the worst song in hip-hop history. And I'm not just saying that because he's uh, proven to be a creep. And then this whole chorus, this like end of the contender, and, and I was like, what is this about? And I'm not going to tell you what it's about yet. Little guitar solo as well. Nice instrumental outro here. Some synth, like 80s synthesizer hits. The vocals are very in your face. My daughter curses me because I any British singer that we hear, she just compares to Martin Sheffield Lickley from Comedy Bang Bang. But what is this about? What is this about? What is the end of the contender? Well, this is about the, the state of the world that we're living in. Okay? This is about men. This is about poor disenfranchised men who feel like they've lost their place in the world and I just see all the young men and it makes me cry because I I, I want them to have a sense of, of belonging and meaning but they can't have it anymore <laughs> all right that's what it is this this is this is Jordan Peterson rock now hey it's not pro Jordan Peterson but it's describing the problem that Jordan Peterson capitalizes on okay it's describing the problem that the manosphere capitalizes on it's describing the anger of men who have been white straight cis het, male who have been at the center of the universe since since we figured out how to conquer the universe we've been at the dead center of it we've been in the default mode for as far back as we can possibly remember and now all of a sudden oops the long uh, curve of society bends towards justice, it's actually starting to curve towards the point where we're maybe not the, the main character of the story. Maybe it turns out we have to give up some of that power which we didn't earn but we took anyway. Maybe these things are changing. But what happens to that person when things change? We do deserve understanding. I'm not saying sympathy. I'm not saying that cishet white men who've had all the power deserve sympathy. They deserve, no. They need understanding. If we are going to advance as a society, we can't just laugh at that. We have to understand it. Now, that doesn't mean we have to give them what they want. Don't give me what I want, okay? Okay? Don't just, don't just say, oh, well, this guy might think he's not going to get that promotion because he's a, not a person of color, so we better give him that or else he's going to become a, a Jordan Peterson fan. No, no, that's not that. But it's, it needs to be understood. And this whole song is about some meme from, 20, from 2015 where there was like a famous boxer from the 70s who was like made fun of on the, on the, like on the screen or something, like, a, like someone filmed him. And he was like, don't you know who I am? I'm Al Pickering or something like that. And the whole joke was that no one knew who he was. And the, what this thing is, what Higgs, Higgs is saying is that like, it's okay to laugh at it, but let's actually have sympathy for somebody who 20 years ago was a household name. No, not sympathy, understanding. Because fuck that guy. You got to get over it. You got to get over it. You're not the center of the world anymore. But we do need to understand it and not just laugh at it. I apologize for the F word. I am way too animated today. I'm just excited to be able to record in my living room. My son's at the dentist. <laughs> Spring break. So I have, a I have a little window here where I can record something. Anyways, it's just beautiful. This is what a lot of the album is about. It's talking about, because don't forget, that person is still at the bottom of the pyramid. Okay? That person is still at the bottom of the pyramid. Most cishet white males... Uh, Okay, most people at the top are cishet white males, but also many people at the bottom are cishet white males, and a lot of their anger and a lot of their fear of wokeism or whatever it is is just working as hard as they can to serve their oppressors at the top of the pyramid. Because as Radiohead said, the pyramid is power. Okay, I'm going to go through the rest of the album much quicker because I think my son's uh, dentist appointment's over. Wild Guess is the first track. It sounds almost in media res, like there's all sorts of instruments. There's like a drum solo, there's like a guitar solo, a fuzzy bass, very weird fish, fishes e, some like goofy solo. <laughs> it's like, this is the only song on the album where the singer's not like, because ah, everything else is playing, which is great because this is a real ass band, R-A-B, a real ass band, and I love hearing it. I love hearing it. Even though, much like Radiohead, they'll often just do like entire songs, <laughs> there's no musicians at all, just computers and bleeps and bloops. It's just great. 
They make reference to under the cobblestones lies the beach. Hey, I teach about the, the French um, uh, student uprisings of 1968. That's a paraphrasing of that sentiment, which is underneath the, the, the pavement, underneath all these roads that we've made, there's sand, there's a beach, there's a representation of being wild and free and not constrained by society. But this album, this song puts forth the idea, maybe that's not so great either. Why do I keep scratching my face? I'm not itching, I'm just nervous. Did you know I'm nervous every time I do a video? It's true. It's weird. It's weird. It's weird I've done a thousand of these things. And I'm nervous every time. And then we get to the stamp, end of the contender. The next track, Cold Reactor. Up, up, up. Damn it. I meant to have my Laurie Anderson CD. Very proud moment. I listen to the song. And just anytime you have a female sounding or a high voice that's uh, like a sampled on a keyboard. Up. Up, up. It's very similar to the song Oh Superman by Laurie Anderson. I thought that. I played this song for my daughter, and she goes, You know, I just can't not hear Laurie Anderson. And I cried. <laughs> I was so proud of her. I never played her Laurie Anderson. I don't know how she knew the song Oh Superman. I just, I cried. <laughs> I was, I, she didn't see me. <laughs> but I was just so proud of her. <laughs> like, I was like, There's a weird thing when you're a parent where, like, Sometimes your kids, um, sometimes your kids are like you in ways that are just not helpful, and sometimes they're like you in ways that are just very sweet. Uh, this is all about that inequality. This is about the idea that the mountain is built out of a hole. You have to dig a hole to build the mountain. The hole represents the lack, represents the people who are being washed on. This is kind of secretly an album about class revolution. Like this album is one of the most based albums I've ever heard, and it's made by people who can't be. They can't be not in their 30s. So these are some old folks like me. Not old as me, but old folks like me, you know, raising the standard. They're about to sing the Internationale here. This is awesome line. I love you like an atom bomb, but I've become a cold reactor. I don't fully understand it, but I feel it. I'm sorry, Satan. I can't do this evil on my own. <laughs> it's beautiful. This image of like, that like this work that we're doing to to make our society worse, to make sure that we... To make sure that we uh, that we that we worship Richard Branson and that we worship uh, Jeff Bezos and Zuckerberg and all those guys that we care about them that we know who they are we have to do all this work in order to do that work we have to really work really hard to keep everyone underneath us and to keep ourselves down to make sure that we lift them up the mountain head there's an outro I listened to this album with my baby this morning just for a whole straight hour just walking around and she laughed at the end of the song because it sounds like Canada geese no nah, no nah, no nah. By the way, they're called Canada geese, not Canadian geese. Next track is called Buddy, Come Over. Ooh, I like this one. This is following up on the Contender one. Little staggered drum beat, tight groove with the bass, and these woozy synths just falling all over it. And then we get the first verse with all these like house claps, like claps from house music. It's all this whole theme, like I want to be the best. It's still the same guy from the Contender song, Alienated Masculinity. I want a tattoo saying, saying PC gone mad, make me a website so I can completely ruin my life. The website's called Facebook. It's just beautiful the way it builds with vocals, great bit with the guitar slightly off beat, a nice like exit melody out of nowhere, awesome song, thematically consistent. Next track is Are You Happy? Sparse drum machine, very echoed and robotic, desolate voice asking this question, are you happy? And that's the issue, right? And that's the question here. The mountain is a lie. Right? It's a lie. It's a lie. The whole thing's a lie. We're screwed. We're not being helped. And it's all about us being animals. And this, there's sort of like a call, it's sort of like the under the under the beach, the sand, some sort of essentially oh, Christ. I'm sorry, they're gonna have to wait to come back home because now I'm into my Rousseau bag. Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote about inequality, the nature of inequality, and he talked about how human beings, well he said man, because back then nature was gendered, man is born free but everywhere he is in chains. And that essentially it is through inequality that we are in chains, and that the inequality came from property and from the idea that someone can have two of something when someone else has nothing. And that we've deprived ourselves of our natural state of happiness. So this is implying that the society which has corrupted us all, that's created this pyramid, because the pyramid is the natural... Is it? Damn it. Is the pyramid the natural result of society? I know if you're a socialist or a collectivist like me. I mean, I'm not a socialist, but I am a collectivist. I don't know. Maybe I'm a socialist, kind of, but the capitalist, too, doesn't matter. 
space and all that. Anyways, whatever I am doesn't matter. What does matter is the question, is all society always going to boil down to a, to a pyramid? Maybe. Next track is The Mad Stone, probably my least favorite, kind of more of a musical song. At times it's sort of Mumford's and sunny, but I like that he takes us to the top of the mountains. At the very top, there was a screen that showed a picture of a man who stood there looking at a picture of a man who stood there looking at a picture of a man, this sort of emptiness at the top, the sort of solipsism. And then the next get TV dog. I got two dogs here, they're not watching TV. Totally different soundscape. Emphatic pluck strings, kind of a Peter Gabriel style vocal production mixed with the Angel Gabriel level of singing and just ethereal high voice. Some the the, the plucked strings become bowed strings at the second uh, on the second uh, chorus. The voice is doing so much here and why is it always liars and ball games when I turn on the television? No, if you break me, you'll have to buy me. I learned it from the television. I assume this is about the corrupting influence of uh, of uh, the media, uh, sort of tying back into that previous thing about the website. But uh, there's no way not to think about this scene from The Shining. They had to in order to survive. Yeah. Don't worry, Mom. I know all about cannibalism. I saw it on TV. See? It's okay. You saw it on the television. Okay. I, I, I'm not saying that this is a direct quote, but I'm saying it's what made me think of. Okay? It's okay. You saw it on the television. <clears throat> My brother does a really good uh, Jack impersonation. I just do an impersonation of his impersonation. Next track is Canary, beating thumpy bass drum sound, kind of very sketchy, uncomfortable song. Like, like you know how there's like a couple ants underneath your shirt right now that are like walking across that space, like right there on your back. You know how there are ants right there right now. The, like that feeling of those ants. That's kind of how the the soundscape is of this a really like ooh computery kid a controlled ooh don't want to say the quiet part out loud we're not profound we're just meat this goes into the same question of if we're animals are we not just meat we're constantly being turned into bacon in this album like we're just gristle for the machine to be eaten then it becomes like an 80s post-punk synth pop song we're singing about the canary under the ground gorgeous guitar bit i do they have a guitarist? I was looking at the credits. Maybe the bass player does guitar and bass. I don't know. These offbeat stabs, uh, this little synth percussion in the second verse. Lots of great things happen in the production here. Next track is called Don't Ask Me to Beg. I don't know if this is in conversation. Hey, speaking of society, look at this. Look at this right here. See, he's trying to he's trying to get into the dog bed, but Bo won't let him. See, because Bo is at the top of the mountain. Poor Toby's over there. <laughs> Bo's in the sun. <laughs> pyramid is power so i don't know if this is in relationship to ain't too proud to beg by the temptations famously covered by the rolling stones um because it's not ain't too proud to beg it's don't ask me to beg and that's the situation that we're in where we're constantly having to beg for things we're trying having to beg for recognition having to beg for scraps we're having to beg for getting five stars we're having to beg to get likes and smashing like buckets and avaas Cool 70s hi-hat ride here, just low bass and fuzzy guitars, almost like Casio drums in the back. They had this whole like chorus thing going with, don't ask me to beg. If I'm going to be tomorrow's bacon, you deserve a Michelin star. Again, we're animals, we're meat. We're constantly being turned into just gristle for the top, okay? We're all being turned into kibble for Bo to eat us. Enter the mirror. Enter the mirror, boy. More synth, kind of housey as well. A little stagger beat to nod your head. It's apparently about a friend going through a hard time, according to the lyrics, which makes it a fine song. Again, Sommeil by Stromae is one of my favorite songs. I love songs about friendships, but I don't see how it ties into the whole album. This album is basically a, a concept album in the same way their last album was basically a concept album. Not in the way of like Pink Floyd, where it tells a story about like going up the mountain, but in the way that's all thematically linked. I don't see how this song fits into that or the next song, but that's okay, because the next song is my favorite song on the album, Your Money, My Summer. This is where they're a real, 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 real band. Now I want to see them in concert. This guitar does this cool high and low notes, this cool like swinging bass and a real drum line. The funny thing was, I was listening to this album, I had my computer on my lap, my laptop on my lap. My baby was walking around just playing with little cups and stuff. She just doesn't care about anything. And then this song comes on, and seriously, she just like looks up at the speaker 
she starts kind of doing this. And then she goes over to the side table. And like just starts like banging. Like she recognized something different was happening in this music. 18 months old. She so, like this was so clear of a division from the previous songs. It's just gorgeous. This chorus, God knows I want to go home. It's just so beautiful. The bass is so good. The singing the chorus is so good. This cool funky instrumental bit there. It's just so nice. And it seems as though it's about the difficulty of traveling during the summer, you know, like your money, my summer, about not really wanting to perform, which ties it perfectly in with the track Petroleum by Yard Act, a different British band from Leeds, which is, this is true, north of Manchester. There's stuff north of Manchester. Why does Manchester get to call itself the North if there's like Newcastle and Leeds already up there, right? That's like San Francisco calling itself Northern California. No, Chief, you're in the middle, okay? You're in the middle of California. All right. Dagger's Edge. Okay, this is funny because at first I thought, hey, this is kind of like 21 Pilots. I'm not dissing. I like 21 Pilots, okay? I like 21 Pilots a lot. They, they are probably the only band in the running with everything, everything in terms of like pop bands that are really great. You know, because Imagine Dragons isn't it anymore, right? Um, but then I listened to it again. It's it's just forgot about Dre. It's just it, like they they might they might owe Scott Storch and Andre Young some money at the end of this because it sounds so much like forgot about Dre off of Chronic Two Thousand and One. More about this sort of like theme. You'll never be a famous dude. I hate to break it to you, but it's true. Vainglorious, your tower reeks of concrete, like force meat battered zoo. More kind of a slight rapping style. You're running on a dagger's edge. We've become bacon. Tomorrow's bacon all the way in here. Then we get to city song. This actually has some U2 style guitar, you know? Just the over a very tight rhythm section groove. It's really nice. The vocoders, again, slightly robotic, slightly vocodered. I don't know what. And then according to his writing, this is about a book that I haven't read called Mark Fisher's Book of Capitalist Realism. And my airplane fell, came right out of my ceiling, American cheese on black and telephone. I called up the office, said I'm not coming in. They don't know my name. I didn't know my name. This is beautiful. This is apparently about the impersonality of working for a big company. I have several nieces and nephews who are now in the job market, and some of them work for these companies that have like tens of thousands of employees, and I, I feel for them, and I tell them, you have to read the work of Franz Kafka. If you work for a large company, if you work in an office, if you have a job that is not as good as my job, right? like a professor, like if you, if you have like a job, I had a job in office for years, right? If you have, just please read the man because he's first of all proof, he's proof that you can have a work a day life and also be a great artist. And also he describes that impersonality. He describes that alienation. And thanks to genius, props to genius and the, uh, the commentator Hai Yarrow, <clears throat> it quotes the part of the book that applies to this song the most and it has to do with Kafka. The supreme genius of Kafka was to have explored the negative atheology proper to capital. The center is missing, but we cannot stop searching for it or positing it. It is not that there is nothing there, it is that what is there is not capable of exercising responsibility. The center is missing. That's, the situ that's where we lived when we worked for these big companies. The center is missing. The center is some super billionaire somewhere else, some board of directors in some other city, in some other place. And we're constantly just walking around in the maze trying to figure out where it is. The center of capital is missing. I told you this dude was based. I told you this band was based. I don't even remember if based is good or bad anymore. But they are, whatever it is, they're it. Album ends with The Witness. Gorgeous ethereal waltz to end the album. Drum machines, a little tinny and nice, arpeggiated synthesizers. Again, sort of like this nice outro. And then it, it does this metaphor of COVID being like a nuclear bomb. There was a blinding light. There was water falling. How could I know that? I wasn't there. That COVID skepticism, all the skepticism, the unfounded skepticism that we have that we believe in that just hurts us, right? Think about how many working class people have died of COVID because of the misinformation that they drink, because of not believing in things that they didn't see, 
because of that website from that song a little while ago, because of all these things, we just keep saying, I wasn't there. It's like a nuclear bomb went off two miles away and we don't know it's there. Beautiful rhythm play at the end and then there's some laughter of some children in the back which sort of connects us up with humanity and makes us feel like humanity might be okay and we might be doing all right. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. These are my Patreons. They help me to buy music. Yo, I love this album. I love this band. You can tell me what other music they did. That's great. But I'm probably just going to buy this and just keep listening to this and uh, raw data feel. Because whatever this band is doing now, it is super duper awesome. Very, very good. Very consistent. Very good. Very, um, very good. You watch this video for 40 minutes and 30 seconds and I don't do grades. And I don't do ratings. And I don't do reactions. But you just got to hear from me. It's very good. All right. Well, what should I do? Should I kick Bo out so that Toby can take the spot in the sun? Or is Toby okay over there? I think he's okay. I think he's okay. You tell me. You tell me in the comments. Should I kick Toby out? Should I kick Bo out? All right. There's the camera.